Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It's April 24th, 2014, and here are our top stories. Tonight, more fake news from the mainstream media as the New York Times publishes fabricated evidence of Russian troops in the Ukraine. Then, a Texas deputy sheriff responds to a burglary by killing the victim's dog. That dog has gone with me every day since she was five weeks old. No, no. In the Hate Crime Reporting Act, it's a dangerous threat to free speech. That's up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. And welcome back. Our top story tonight. The New York Times published fabricated evidence of Russian troops in eastern Ukraine. And this article appeared in the New York Times a couple of days ago. Scrutiny over photos said to tie Russia units to Ukraine. They're desperate to portray the anti-government protests in eastern Ukraine as being completely orchestrated and in fact carried out by Russian special forces. Now it would be naive to think that Russians were not having some kind of influence in what's currently unfolding in eastern Ukraine. But that slam dunk of proof that Russian forces are actually involved in directing the opposition in seizing government buildings has proved to be elusive for the Kiev government, the Obama administration, and the mainstream media. So instead of finding actual evidence to back up that claim, they decided just to make it up out of fresh air. So the New York Times published these photos, amongst others, which show Russian special forces here operating in Georgia in 2008. And then they show pictures from the recent uprising, the anti-government protests in eastern Ukraine, claiming that this individual is the same Russian special forces soldier seen in Georgia in 2008. As you can see from this image, the New York Times, if I just scroll up here, they actually chose to use a pixelated image of this Special Forces soldier when there was a clear image of him fully available. And again, with this image here, supposedly shot in Ukraine, this individual, they use a very badly pixelated image when a perfectly clear image was available. And why is that? Well, it's because obviously they're claiming it's the same guy. To all appearances, it's not the same individual. Yes, they look similar, but as the BBC notes, in this 2008 image, the Special Forces soldier has a red ginger graying beard, whereas in the image from 2014 from Ukraine, this individual obviously has a black beard that's graying, and it appears that he also has black hair. Although they look reasonably similar you can see that the face is somewhat different and the color of the beard the hair suggests that it is indeed an entirely different person here's the next piece of damning evidence contrived by the post coup kiev government authorized for release by the obama administration and blithely regurgitated by the new york times apparently this russian soldier seen in crimea is the same individual as this person seen in eastern Ukraine. Now, <laughs> forgive me for not having some kind of x-ray see-through vision, but how on earth can you make the assumption that these two are the same guy when you can't even see this guy's face because he's got a full balaclava on? Yeah, this is what was printed in the New York Times as bombshell Loctite evidence of Russian troops directing the activities in eastern Ukraine. Completely ridiculous. And you can see Paul's full report on Infowars.com. Hate Crime Reporting Act, a dangerous threat to free speech. Introduced earlier this week by Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts, the Hate Crime Reporting Act of 2014 would task the National Telecommunications and Information Administration with filing reports on internet radio and television content that seeks to advocate and encourage violent acts and the commission of hate crimes. But as the Boston Herald points out, all it's going to do is have people scouring the internet, TV and radio for speech that it finds threatening. So they say your speech is hateful. So if you say, I don't like the drone strikes killing uh, 
80% of the combat non-combatants over there in Pakistan. That's what the Pakistan Interior Minister said. 80% of the people killed by those strikes are not uh, enemy combatants. You're a racist because you're against the Obama administration. If you don't like uh, Mrs. Clinton, then you're sexist because you don't support Hillary Clinton 2016 because of the Benghazi situation and her lack of accountability on that. Or if you say, hey, I'm going to point out all the inconsistencies in the Boston bombing marathon narrative, now you're deeply racist. They'll just label you whatever they want to label you. So this is going to be a dire, uh, dire strike against your free speech, not just people in the mainstream media, but also people in alternative media, people who have blogs, just anybody. Don't let this, go, uh, this draconian measure of legislation pass through your state, the state of Massachusetts. Tell them, no, we don't want this in our state, and hopefully you can get rid of this guy, uh, Mr. Senator Ed Markey. Tell him to hit the bricks. And somebody hit the bricks, hit the streets, that is, and was out on the streets educating people about the surveillance state. And we have the headline here, artists create street lights that monitor conversations, but it already exists for real. Wild, Wired Magazine reports that Kyle McDonald and Brian House created the Converse Niche, device out of household objects and a miniature computer, for under $100. And it's made to look like a lamp bulb, but the device can be fitted with any standard lighting fixture. So basically, these guys were out on the street just trying to educate people about these things that are already in place in cities such as Las Vegas, where they have these lights that can actually monitor your conversations. And InfoWars has been reporting on this for a long time. I had reports Alex did back in the early 2000s, possibly even back in the 90s. He was going down the street saying, hey, uh, these stoplights can monitor you. They are watching you. If you said, oh, you're crazy because you think that that camera on that street post up there is actually watching me and now it is and he said your phones are watching you your computers are watching you your cable boxes are watching you your xboxes are watching you but it's all crazy conspiracy theory till it actually comes true or at least the mainstream media actually admits this now and now you're a kook if you don't like it people say okay yeah the street lights are spying on me as bizarre and uh, weird as that is but I'm okay with that because I have nothing to hide. I mean, what is going to have to happen before people realize that just because you don't have anything to hide doesn't mean that you should just volunteer your privacy or just say, you look into my house. Do you want to be like in, in England where they want to have people come to your house if you have uh, allegations of some type of child neglect? They send a little nanny to live in your house, or at least they're trying to do that. They already have the cameras out there monitoring people's uh, activities. So this is just another step towards that. And somebody who took the wrong step was an officer who shot somebody's dog. This happens all too often here in the state of Texas. It's happened several times in the recent years just around the city of Austin. But now we have this new situation. Cop responding to burglary kills victim's dog. So this was a situation somebody called the police to come and help them because their house had been broken into. Uh, the thieves stole several valuable items, including firearms. And two and a half hours later, the deputy sheriff uh, gets around to getting to the residence. A guy has a dog, and lo and behold, the dog runs out to meet the sheriff when he arrives. The sheriff says, hey, man, I was in fear for my life, pulls out his gun and shoots the dog. And, you know, I'm not a fan of uh, willy-nilly using pepper spray and tasers, but if you have those things, why can't you use those instead of just shooting the dog dead? And you can watch the video on Infowars.com and say, hey, man, I was, I was in fear for my life. And the guy said, you know, I have a small dog. I mean, I'm not sure how big the dog was at the time of the, of the shooting, but he says my dog was small. It wasn't going to hurt you, but the officer felt that his life was threatened, and that's what he had to do. And it's, it's very sad. We also saw things happen right here in the city of Austin. Justice for Cisco, to be brief, an officer responded to an incident at the wrong address. Well, he was given the wrong dress, address, shows up and shoots somebody's dog. He says, your dog was charging towards me. He was like, my dog was in the front yard and greeted a stranger. Why did you shoot my dog? Shrugged his shoulders and walked off as if nothing happened. So that's the kind of things that you have to deal with, and hopefully we can get justice for this man because justice for Cisco was never really served. But you can do justice to the fight of liberty, and you can join PrisonPlanet.tv. We'll tell you this before we go to breaking. Stop by PrisonPlanet.tv and get yourself a 15-day free trial. The Alex Jones Show, the Nightly News, the Rants, and so much more on PrisonPlanet.tv. Now stay tuned because after this break, our new crew member, Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs, is going to be talking about the... Uh, the injustice that happens at the VA, you go in and you say, I need medical treatment, and they put you on a waiting list basically to die. He's going to be talking about that. And also Syrian girl, Mimi Alaham, will be joining us to talk about some of the new war drums being beat concerning the Syria situation. So stay tuned for both of those. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. And welcome back. We have reports that a conservative 40 veterans have died over the past two years waiting for medical treatment. This is absolutely unheard of, absolutely unnecessary. And for more on this, we go to a true military veteran, Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs. 
Thanks for joining us, Joe, and welcome to the team. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, America, get ready. This is what government-run health care is. Welcome to hell. That's right. It is hell. I mean, because we see the socialized health care. We see it in other places. We see it uh, in England. Our own Paul Joseph Watson is over there. And he said he went to the, uh, went to the doctor to get some medicine. They just gave him uh, this dinky little health care package. He said, no, I have some real health care issues. And now we're seeing these things start to come over here to the States. Well, what's interesting is that I had a lot of friends talking about, oh, it's going to be so great. Free health care for all. Government-run health care is going to be amazing. And I just laughed and laughed. I mean, I've been with it for 10 years. It's mm -hmm. horrible. I mean, I, it's been two years since I've been to the VA. I throw up blood almost every night. And I've been constantly trying to be seen. And it's something that they put you on the back burner. They make an appointment. They take that appointment away. And they just keep doing it over and over again until next thing you know, you've got something that is just horrible and it's too late. You know, they got a VA a veteran who died from cancer. He begged and begged and plead for them to help him out. And now he's dead. Yeah, that just shows you. If you get anything for free, like you go out to a, a, some marathon or whatever, they're giving out free water bottles. Anything that's free, it's cheaply made, it doesn't work well, as opposed to you can go buy your own, you know, 20 bucks, and it works great. So tell us about your experiences when you went out to the VA and how you were pretty much got this uh, substandard care. Well, when I got out, they said, you know, you're, you're in for a, uh, a treat. Fast, uh, fast uh, times, you know, Medicare or uh, medical... Uh, pills and all that stuff would be getting to you really fast. Mm -hmm. And it's just not like that at all. I mean, the first day I waited an hour, hour and a half just to have someone tell me that I was in the wrong line. <laughs> and then they sent me to another line. And then when, they, when I told them what was wrong with me, they said, no, that's not an issue. All we need to do is just throw some pills, give you that, and be on your way. That was about two years ago. Since then, I haven't been back. I've been trying to make appointments, and I just can never get through. I mean, it is a horrible, horrible disaster. Have they ever tried to give you any type of uh, psychotropics? Uh, that was while I was in. But uh, up until about a year ago, I finally dumped all those medications in the, uh, in the toilet and flushed those down. And since then, I've been a lot better. So it's like, okay, there's nothing wrong with you puking up the blood. Just take these pills to alter your mind to make you think that it's pretty much okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I can't sleep now to this day. I mean, eventually it's getting a little bit more and more. But I was on these drugs for so long that I was a zombie. I mean, it was just horrible. And Joe, I know you have a lot of information here. What's the most important things that people should know? Well, America, what you have to look forward to with Obamacare is exactly this. Everything that you've asked for, you're going to get. And all I want to know is, are you going to be on the next death panel? All right, Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs, thank you for your time and welcome to the team. I look forward to more reports and you can see Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs on InfoWars.com. Stay tuned right after this break for more special reports. As some continue to instigate a conflict with Russia, we now have a former director at the State Department saying that we should bomb Syria for the sake of Ukraine. Syrian girl, a.k.a. Mimi Alaham, is here to address these issues and so much more. She joins us now via Skype. Thanks for joining us, Mimi. Thank you for having me. It's right. long time no see. Yeah, I know. It's been too long, too long. So let's get straight into it. I know you have a lot to talk about, and I'll try to shut up and let you make your points. But I want to get your comments on this first. We have this article on Infowars.com, Bomb Syria for Ukraine's Sake. And this is Anne Marie Slaughter. She is the former director of policy and planning for the U.S. State Department. And she said basically that the U.S. needs to uh, start banning, or Obama uh, more in particular, needs to start bombing and showing his uh, use of force to pretty much put the Russians in check. And she thinks one of the good places to start would be Syria. What is your comment on that? Uh, I think, you know, it's really a window into how government, U.S. government policymakers think. And she was the head director of the, um, of this. The policy, policy. U.S. Yeah, State yes. Department. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, in specifically, uh, she was suggesting to use the humanitarian resolution, the uh, humanitarian relief resolution that was supposed to pressure both sides to break the sieges on the cities that um, they were holding. So both the Syrian government and the ins insurgents or al-Qaeda terrorists have been using uh, siege tactics on the cities that the other person controls. And um, in Aleppo, it's the insurgency, they recently actually cut off water supplies to the entirety of the, the portion of of Aleppo that's controlled by the government, which has millions of people living inside it. Whereas in Homs, you had the general amnesty where a lot of 
the civilians were taken out of the city and now there's there's hardly any of even insurgents left many of them surrendered and there's a siege there but of course you know this un resolution about getting humanitarian relief into the syrian cities that are under siege of course it's going to be selectively um you know enforced enforced precisely and it's it's in fact according to Anne Marie Slaughter that this resolution can be used to attack Syria and bomb the country and of course destroy all of the infrastructure that might have still been standing after you know three years of war. So those of us who are cynical enough to realize that in politics uh civilians actually are the least of the uh government politicians concern mm-hmm. then they know that this UN resolution is of course more about military strategy and you know this is highlighted as one of those uh, again one of those things that they're going to use to uh, help bring aid to the insurgency to to break sieges to allow uh, troop movements and of course this can be used to attack Syria so as this um, crazy woman suggests and of course this uh this new thing she's saying, in addition to bombing Syria, which she suggests, we also know that the U.S. is funding the Al Qaeda rebels in Syria. And uh, Mimi, you and I have talked about this briefly uh, beforehand, talking about the different groups of the Syrian rebels. Just you know, for a base understanding to uh, people who may not know, what's the difference between the various Syrian rebel groups out there? Okay, so the name that people will recognize a lot is the FSA which is supposed to be the moderate rebels. And notice they don't use the word secular, they use the word moderate because Mm -hmm. the FSA is still uh, religiously leaning um, to this Salafi Wahhabi ideology that Al-Qaeda also holds, but they say moderate because they're willing to work with the United States, um, you know, openly, whereas Al-Qaeda is more underhand with its working for it. But in fact, this group, this FSA that we've, Uh, all been talking about for so many years has, in fact, the majority of it have changed to a different group now called the Islamic Front. This Islamic Front has groups such as Ahrar al-Sham in it that was founded by um, an Al-Qaeda member that was uh, once, I believe, in Guantanamo Bay. Mm. Um, Ahrar al-Sham is not designated as a terrorist group by the United States, which is interesting, even though um, it's, it's got al-Qaeda affiliations. So this is one of the groups in the Islamic Front, which is now the moderate rebels, is Ahrar al-Sham. And they work quite openly with a group that the US government has designated as al-Qaeda, the sort of like the scapegoat group, even though many of the other ones have very much the same tactics and ideology. Mm -hmm. But Jabhat al-Nusra, the Islamic Front, which is now the main moderate insurgent group, is working openly with Jabhat al-Nusra, aka Al-Qaeda, and we saw this in, in Kassab, we're seeing it in Homs right now. Homs is mainly, the like the vast majority of the fighters are Jabhat al-Nusra, they're Al-Qaeda. So um, it's very interesting, but the media, they love to point to the fact that the, the insurgents are fighting this third group known as ISIS, um, the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant, Also, this group started off in Iraq in 2006, 2007, came later in the war, and it was quite, uh, basically just killed Shia Iraqis and put bombs in marketplaces, nothing more. But um, yes, uh, this, the media loves to highlight the fact that there's rebel infighting, the moderate rebels are fighting this ISIS, which was Mm Al-Qaeda. Now it's just even worse than Al-Qaeda, the media is saying. But the, the fact of the matter is, the, the moderate rebels are working with one faction of Al-Qaeda, Jabhat al-Nusra, against another faction of Al-Qaeda, ISIS. And the media is trying to paint this as moderates versus Al-Qaeda, because of course, um, it's, it, the fact that the US has been backing Al-Qaeda has been so discrediting mm-hmm. um, these last three years. 
And it's a big deal. I don't know how the media is where you are, but here in the States, they'll show a video of Al-Qaeda rebels with the black Al-Qaeda flag and then say it's Assad or they say it's some other group when they clearly are flying the flag, even have little watermarks in the video so you know that, that it's Al-Qaeda. It's just completely ridiculous. And another thing that's going on, Mimi, I want to get your comment on. We have this article, FBI informant directed hack attacks on Iran, Syria, and Pakistan. Now, Mimi, this is basically an article talking about how these various hacker groups such as Anonymous and LulzSec can be infiltrated because, you know, of course, this organization such as Anonymous, you don't know who's who's in it, right? So anybody can put on a Guy Fox mask and sit on the on the YouTube screen and just say, hey, I'm representing this agency, I'm representing that agency. And so these guys get infiltrated and now we see these hack attacks targeting Syria, Iran and other countries. Uh, I haven't seen the article, but I know for a fact that some of the anonymous uh, members that have been their identity has been exposed have turned to work for the FBI. I know that Lulsec, uh, uh one of the members of Lulsec came out and exposed one of them, but also there's some that like remain unnamed. Um, they run, of course, there's Twitter accounts. There's a very popular one called Anonymous Operations. And they have uh, many thousands and tens of thousands of followers. Of course, you don't know who runs these things, but mm -hmm. they direct uh, their audience to what they deem to be worthy causes. And of course, these causes always seem to happen to be ones that the U.S. State Department support as well. Of course. So um, I know also, I just wanted to make one other point about that, that when the U.S. State Department uh well, um, excuse me, no, more specifically, when the NSA and the CIA target people and gain information about them from maybe uh, defectors or uh, blackmailing people, um, and, and technologically as well using Google, of course, and Microsoft, as we saw in the, the leaks that exposed Microsoft by the Syrian the Electronic Army, mm -hmm. um, they, they then get these anonymous groups to pretend to have hacked something and released the the information about um, other hackers' identities to basically get them killed. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, yeah, you know about this as much as we do here in the States, and it's just a whole big deal, and it's because we see all these groups who, that's the problem with these groups, and I said it before, is because you don't really know who's in it, so anybody can be turned, anybody could just say, it could be a straight up FBI agent, somebody who's not even been turned, just gets up there and says, hey, I'm anonymous. You know, and I know we have, you know, many uh, hacktivists, as they like to be called, who do good work, and they're trying to release information, have the uh, the Freedom of Information Act and so forth, but you have these problems persist. Now, Mimi, I've been uh, asking the question, so I want you to leave us uh, with just whatever you think is relevant. Well, um, I'm always, uh, on the topic of hacking, I'm always uh, curious as to why they always say that uh, Russia and China are he helping the Syrian hackers and the Syrian Electronic Army when, if, when they've been uh, designated as a bigger threat than even Russia or China. So that's one topic I'm interested in. But more importantly, I wanted to, to talk about um, what's going to happen in Syria in the future, what might happen, um, what might be the next step that they they use to attack the country sure. um, in its fight against Al Qaeda. Uh, I think that the insurgency is on its last thread. Um, I don't think any weapons that or training that they're, the media is coming out with, the CIA is initiating, etc., is going to affect the outcome. However, I the thing that worries me is last time, I, as I said on the show that the U.S.'s uh, government's main concern, main interest in Syria, not humanitarian, at the time is was just to get rid of Syria's chemical weapons. And then as we saw in Libya and Iraq, the scenario afterwards, you know, 10 years later, they would come back and just devastate the country once again. Mm -hmm. That's what happened with Iraq. And I'm just, I'm not sure what will happen after the chemical weapons are gone. And of course, the, the uh, U.S. Uh, mouth, Peace, government mouthpieces uh, are always, you know, quacking that uh, the Syria is not removing them fast enough. And I wonder what they have planned for after the, they're removed. That's pretty much. That's pretty much what, it. The, yes, that's pretty much the only thing that could change the outcome, which is a victory for Syria against this Al Qaeda, um, these fanatics that are backed by. By the um, states. 
the states. And, and I mean, you guys state. could definitely get a, a easier victory if we would stop funding these people. And I'm glad to see that people are at least starting to acknowledge it because we see even mainstream outlets now picking up these stories, such as NPR. I mean, it's you know, <laughs> the sugar coated kind of reports, but at least they're presenting this to a, a, a wide mass audience. And now, Mimi, I'm we're, sure we're about the U.S. people were informed that they would definitely take a stand against uh, their the their government's funding of these groups. But unfortunately, the U.S. media is so controlled that they keep the U.S. people in the dark. But um, I'm glad to see that you know you can tell that they would be able to make a stand about these topics. Exactly. Now, Mimi, we've come to the end of our show. So just give us your uh, your contact information and how people can keep up with you online. Um, if you would please subscribe to my YouTube channel, um, Syrian Girl Partisan, and my Twitter account, Partisan Girl, and my Facebook account, Partisan Girl, as well. All right, Mimi Alaham, the Syrian Girl, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for this edition of the InfoWars Nightly News. Be sure to stop by InfoWars.com and also InfoWarsNews.com. We'll see you again tomorrow night. Introducing Pro One. All of your filtration in one system, portable, on the go. No more do you have two or three filters to just reduce sodium fluoride. You have a system that cuts out the sodium fluoride and up to 95% of hydrofluorosilicic acid. Advanced manufacturing technology combines silver impregnated white ceramic with new Aquamedics advanced media for removal of fluoride and other heavy metals, all in one filter element. It is the only one that does it and out of the gate. We have it discounted at 10% off with promo code WATER. This is the only system that in one unit helps reduce or remove pesticides, herbicides, chloramines, ammonia, and chlorine, hydrofluorosilicic acid, the most common form of fluoride not covered by other fluoride filter brands, and sodium hexafluorosilicate. Get your Pro Pure with a new Pro One filter today at InfoWarsStore.com or by calling 888-253-3139. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. Members can share their passcode with up to 11 other people, and your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.